Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to the Wolverine Caucus. We are so excited to see you today. And we like to say at the University of Michigan that we feel that we're changing the world one forum at a time. So we do appreciate you being here today. This forum is generously supported by the UM Alumni Association and the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations. My name is Veronica Johnson, and I'm happy to introduce Craig Ruff. Craig is co-chair of the Wolverine Caucus, and this long-going series is a wonderful way to keep all of you aware of what's going on from the perspectives of our deans and faculty at the University of Michigan. We're excited that Dean Deborah Ball is joining us today. And without further ado, here's Craig. some distinguished people I have to introduce. Well, I don't have to, I want to. Representative Eric Nesbitt. He's on my program. Uh, Representative Scott Dianda. Well, I know one of these here. Lieutenant Governor John Cherry. Oh, oh Representative uh, Huggy Wright. Yay, I got one. Thank you. Um, Deborah Ball has really shaken up uh, not just the College of Education, uh, I would say the whole University of Michigan. I'll tell you, you go to faculty meetings, you go to receptions with the president, uh, uh, you meet uh, with uh, John Cherry on the alumni board, and everybody has seen such a dramatic improvement change because of this wonderful person. Uh, probably one of the finest uh, deans by reputation uh, that you could possibly run into. Now, being a dean uh, where the operating philosophy is always plausible deniability, uh, being a dean kind of implies you would be an expert in uh, teaching. And that's all it is. She's a real life expert. She served on national groups. Uh, she was an elementary school teacher for 15 years, uh, teaching that very difficult to master subject, mathematics. Um, and it is just, it, she currently is also chairing a council for the legislature and the governor on teacher effectiveness. And uh, maybe you'll have a comment or two about where, what the status of that is. But without any other ado, uh, Deborah Ball, Dean of the College of Education. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. It's my great honor to be here. I've enjoyed each time that I've had the opportunity to talk with you here. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today about the what the work that we've been doing at the University of Michigan to uh, completely overhaul the approach to preparing teachers for the work of teaching. Um, it is related to the Council on Educator Effectiveness, which I am chairing for the state of Michigan. That council, which I'm not going to talk about in great detail, is charged with developing the educator evaluation system for Michigan. Read that teacher evaluation and administrator evaluation. And we are later this month going to complete the draft of our report. And this summer we'll be completing and releasing that set of recommendations to the legislature, to the governor. And what we hope we'll accomplish is to have built something that other states have tried to do, but we've tried to do it better, and that is a, a real system for ensuring that practicing educators in the state of Michigan get concrete feedback about their work that enables them to improve the instruction they provide to our state's children. And you'll see as I get into the problem of initial training of teachers why those two problems are related. However, I'm going to concentrate primarily on the entry to teaching, which as I think I will help you understand is a massive problem, not only in our own state but nationally. So I'm going to try to open up for you what is it about that problem and why is it an important policy lever. Um, so the title of this presentation is Putting American Schools Back to Work. Uh, the Michigan model scales up. So I'm going to be attempting to tell you a story of what the problem is that the School of Education and more broadly the University of Michigan set out to tackle 
at what we've come up with as a way of tackling that problem and our latest efforts to move beyond not only our university and our state, but to have an impact, a footprint on this problem nationally. So that's the goal of what I'm going to be doing. Um, I'd like to start uh, by taking you back to an op-ed piece that appeared in the New York Times last fall. If you didn't see it, I urge you to go back looking for it. It was written by Nicholas Kristof, who, uh, am I blocking your view? Uh, people who, uh, many of you know, writes about education regularly and for the Times. This particular op-ed, uh, the quote that I particularly appreciated about it was at the beginning of the piece in which he argued that the most important civil rights battleground today in this country is education and likewise the most important struggle against poverty is the one fought inside of schools. It's not a well-recognized fact that uh, teacher <laughs> effects are very large. By that I mean the effects of skilled teaching on children's life chances is much greater than most people understand. People are fond of talking about all kinds of things they think are the matter with American schools. People watch too much television, changing family structure, intergenerational poverty, and it's not that those things don't have a role in under explaining things about our nation's youth, but what gets too frequently overlooked is powerful social science evidence about the differential effects that different qualities of teaching produce in young people's learning. I, as a person who taught a lot of my life and who now helps to prepare teachers and make policy about this, find this to be a very promising and potent result from research, because what it suggests is that although Poverty is obviously an enormous social problem, and as are several of the other things I alluded to, changing the quality of teaching is actually a problem we can tackle. It's something we can do something about. And so if we know that the difference between having a skilled teacher and not a skilled teacher is large, it makes a lot of sense to devote policy efforts and practice toward changing that game. And I want to give you a little background about this. One thing about Christoph's piece that I especially appreciate is that he unpacks in very digestible terms what I mean when I say teacher effects are large. So for example, at one point in the article, he explains that if you're a child whose teacher is among the distribution of teacher skills in the lowest percentiles of teacher skill, it is as though in that school year you will lose approximately four months of instruction. So that is a non-trivial effect on your chances as a child. And similarly, sort of comparably, if you are a child who has the luck of the draw and gets a teacher whose skills are in the upper, let's say 10 to 20% of the distribution of teacher quality, it will be similarly as though you gain four to five months of instruction in that year. So those are big differences in what kids have opportunities to learn. And it's worth pointing out, in case you don't know this, that the distribution of these qualities of teaching are not random in our country or in our state. If you were a minority student or a child living in poverty, you are far more likely to get teachers from the lower end of the distribution, which in turn only compounds what we know to be huge differential effects of the way schooling has impacted our nation's youth, depending on who they are. So Christoph's article is quite accessible and useful, but one thing I think he gets completely wrong is that about two-thirds of the way through the article, he says, based on all of this, what we most need to be doing is finding all of those bad teachers at the bottom end and getting rid of them. But what he has completely misunderstood about this is that what we really have to be figuring out, and I hope you can trace this, is we need to know what those people are doing who are in the upper 10 to 20 percent of teaching quality. What are they doing? And we should ensure that every teacher is able to do that work. We have a very large workforce. So thinking that our entire problem will be solved by getting rid of a few people, and it's not that many, we're talking 5 to 10 percent at the lower end of the distribution, still leaves us with 90 to 95 percent of the people out there who are not doing the highest quality or most skillful work that they could be. So my conclusion and that of my colleagues at the University of Michigan was, we need to tackle this problem. We need to figure out what it would mean to ensure that every teacher actually was able to do the work that we're asking them to do, which has everything to do with the future of our society. I'm not, I'm not being overly dramatic when I try to say, teachers are the people who build the human capital for the country. So taking the kind of chancy approach that we have taken historically in this country, making sort of bets like, oh, somebody might be born to be a teacher and maybe with a little experience we'll get it right. You don't have to look very far to see the failure of that way of working. So Christoph thinks, just find the bad people and get rid of them. The University of Michigan School of Education disagrees and set out to figure out what it would it look like to make a true system of training that would assure that each person who's licensed to teach was actually capable of producing growth in students. So 
You probably know these kinds of things, but I thought I might just make it plainer to you that the strategy the country deployed since about the mid-19th century does not work. So for example, I think it's an embarrassment that when you compare nationally our achievement in just reading and math, we rank 11th in the world in reading, and of course reading is hard to compare across language and culture, and 24th in math. That puts us below the mean of the OECD countries. I mean, I can't think of anything more embarrassing that a country of the quality and the resources that this country has could possibly have that be the way we stand when we compare ourselves to other nations. And I'm not going to this morning take up all the issues about international comparisons, but let it suffice to say that when we compare ourselves to other countries, we cherry pick a lot. We pick the things we think are the differences between us and other countries and fail to notice the big things that are different about what we do in education <coughs> and what other countries do. And one of them is the way we treat teaching quality. It might be useful for you to just be reminded that the stakes are high, that children are actually at risk when we take such a chancy strategy. This has a graph that just gives you a little a visual for the moment of lifetime earnings by, high, by attainment educationally. So the difference between being a high school dropout and your lifetime earning projections and someone who has a professional degree or a master's degree are significant. You can see how much they rise. And across uh, earning power across one's lifetime, a very big difference in the potential earning power. And that's just thinking about it economically at the individual level. The costs are enormous when you think about the waste of human capital by not more dil diligently and systematically growing the young people who will cure cancer, uh, solve social problems, lead the nation. The fact that we don't attend to this more carefully is an enormous waste. So I've already told you that good teaching is powerful. And just to put a point on it, what these results show that Christoph was citing is that when you try to explain why some children have made progress across a school year and others have not, many people think that the way to consider this is to look at lots of other factors. And what I'm telling you is that teaching quality, the skill of the teacher, is the largest factor in explaining differences in student achievement. So that's what he's talking about when he says teacher effects are large. Another way to understand this problem of the differential quality of teaching is, I like this one because it makes it quite clear, if in, at the end of fifth grade you were a child who has had three teachers who are considered to be ineffective in a row, in other words, not skilled at the teaching of math, the difference between you and someone who's had three pretty skillful teachers in a row is that you will be in fifth grade in the 29th percentile comparatively in math achievement versus the 83rd. Those are huge quartile differences just on the basis of the quality of the teaching you've had. And what partly this helps you to see is that the effects compound. So if you have not a very skillful teacher one year and you have another one the next year, it's not like it just kind of marches along. It gets worse and worse <coughs> over time. What I want to persuade you of is that this is putting children dramatically at risk in the way that we worry about risk in all other sectors, healthcare, transportation, you name it, we worry about risk. We don't worry sufficiently about the risk to young people by taking such a lackadaisical approach to the question of teaching quality, when in fact we know it makes a difference and in fact we know something about how to change that. So there are 50 million people in the country. When I talk about human capital, that's a lot of people who are going to be the leaders, the scientists, the inventors, the parents, the voters of the mid-21st century. But on the whole, they're getting very uneven education in this country, dramatically uneven. Some people are getting a good education, and unfortunately, some of the leaders of the country are most likely to have children or acquaintances who are getting the high end of the stick and may not quite understand how hugely variable it is. But in general, we see huge complaints from the sectors that they're neither prepared as they leave, even if they graduate from high school, they're underprepared for the workforce, they're underprepared for post-secondary education. And, you know, to consider broader views of education, they're also underprepared for participation in a diverse democracy. And I think one only has to look as far as some of the political debates that go on around election time to see how poorly educated many young people are about what it is to vote, what it is to reach consensus in a democracy, what are the issues. They're not well prepared for that either, and that's not just about their lifetime earnings. So the goal that we set out to tackle was how could you reverse this? How could you ensure that every child in this country would get skilled teaching every year and have that no longer be a rarity. One device I like to use sometimes with audiences, is, and I won't do it, but I want you to imagine, is ask you, how many times in your own K-12 experience did you have a teacher whom you would consider to be highly skilled at helping you learn, who really made a difference? I don't mean like the high-end person who turned your life around. I mean like a pretty skillful teacher who all year in that subject you grew, you learned, you did things you couldn't have done all on your own. And on average, when I ask a room full of people like this, 
most people at best think that they've had 10% of their teachers like that. And mostly say, you know, I had one really good high school English teacher, or I had a great third grade teacher who made a difference to me. But that's pretty shocking, because if I asked you how often when you've had your car repaired was the person who repaired it skillful enough to fix the problem, you wouldn't say one out of 10. You would actually say the one out of 10 was the big problem that you did something about, but the nine times out of 10, the person did fix your car or repaired your electrical system in your house, or cut your hair correctly, or didn't crash the plane when you got on it. So the fact that we in all other sectors think it's expectable that the person performing the service or conducting the work will do it well, we've somehow come to tolerate it as normal that the excellent teacher or the skilled teacher is a rare phenomenon. So that's the goal, is to reverse that. So what I want to try to do with you today is to help you understand why our argument is that improved professional training is key to this. Many of you might be thinking, oh, paying teachers better would be the main thing to do, or recruiting better would be better, or getting schools to be more supportive of teachers' work would be an important strategy. And I am not saying that those things don't matter. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that if you did all of those things and didn't improve training, you would be nowhere. So I'm putting training central because too often we try to find the quick and dirty way to achieve better teaching, change the curriculum, change the testing, improve something about the school leadership. All of those things are important, but they don't get us where we need to be if we don't improve the quality of teaching. And the main thing I want to do is give you a view of what would that look like actually to have improved professional training. What are we talking about here? And what I'll be telling you is a story about how the University of Michigan has changed our program, but I'm also going to be explaining to you why this is a national problem to which we're contributing through the work we do in our own university. So first, it might be useful for you to know if you don't know a lot about like what is it that happens now? How do people become teachers? I think it's useful for you to understand we have no professional system for the way people enter teaching. We do have a lot of systems, but none of them is professionally grounded the way you see in medicine or even trade-based the way you see in plumbing. It's not the education profession that has anything to say about the standards for entry to teaching or what training looks like. It's other people. So there are systems, but they're not professionally grounded. So what do I mean by that? For example, there's no common curriculum, no agreement in this country about what someone has to be able to do before they're licensed to be with young people independently. No agreement about that at all. There is some agreement about the academic knowledge they should have studied, but I'm sure if any of you in this room has ever taught or tried to help your kid with homework or watched a teacher, you'll understand that there is a big difference between being good at math and being able to explain math to someone else. So academic standards are important, but they do not get you to teaching quality. They only are a prerequisite for that. Another explanation of what I mean when I say there's no system is there are a huge number of providers. So yes, it's a large workforce, so you might expect there to be many programs and many people who train teachers, but it's bizarre how many there are. There are it's hard to count, actually. There are 1,400 institutions of higher education alone, universities and colleges, who prepare teachers, and they prepare about 89% of the teachers in this country. But then there are also lots of other alternative routes into teaching kind of charter school-like uh, programs, not in charter schools, but independent programs. There are also ways that people get into teaching just by being, you know, having a college degree and being allowed to start teaching. There are residency programs in cities. So there are other <coughs> pathways, and there are probably about 3,000 different independent providers. So that makes it pretty difficult for there to be a common system that could ensure that people have things that they actually can demonstrate they can do. And maybe most crucial is that there is no, and this should shock you and appall you, there is no common standard for entry to independent practice, and I would like to say on young people. With young people might be more polite, but on young people. There is no standard for entry. The way someone becomes a certified teacher, uh, aka a license, is that the person graduates from a program that has been approved by the state. States grant licenses or certificates. And the way that someone gets a teaching license is to graduate from a program that the state has approved. So the University of Michigan School of Education program is routinely inspected or reviewed by the State of Michigan Department of Education, as this happens in every state. And what they do to review us is they examine syllabi of what we provide in our courses. They do not look at how we teach those things. They do not look at evidence about whether our graduates can do any of the work. So by inspecting what we offer, that is the inputs, they then determine we're approved, and then when I and my faculty say these people finished our program, the state grants them a license. 
They do take a test along the way. It's a test of basic math and content skill. For students at the University of Michigan, this is the kind of thing they pass before they even start education, so it's not something that says much about whether they're ready to teach. It might tell you that they can calculate with fractions, which is not unimportant, but is not the same thing as saying they're ready to teach that to children. And moreover, there's nothing in our system, in any state, that requires the individual practitioner, the teacher, to demonstrate that he or she can do the work before he or she earns a license. Now, that doesn't happen in other fields. So my daughter, for example, is a clinical nurse midwife. She completed an approved program, very rigorous medical program. However, she wasn't allowed to begin practicing in her new position until she passed boards. And she wasn't allowed to sit for boards until in her program she passed a whole series of performance exams that actually inspected her ability to do particular practices with patients. And that is common across professions and even across skilled trades. So I want to be clear with you about what it means that people do not have to demonstrate individual capability before they're licensed to practice alone on children. So let's think a little bit, what would we want initial training of teachers to do? <coughs> And what would we want licensure to mean? I think there are basically three things that you should appreciate. One is they should take as central or as imperative the rights of children. So instead of worrying, oh, we might deny someone the right to teach by getting it wrong, we should actually be worrying about getting it wrong for children by letting people teach who aren't skillful enough to be there. But that's not how we've tended to think. We've worried so much about staffing classrooms that we've worried more about making it easier for people to get in. Often you see editorials like, let's lower the bar for entry to teaching. So I think, like, what are these people thinking about? To say lower the bar to get into teaching makes virtually no sense. I mean, I know what they're saying when they say it, but if you really think about what they mean or what the eventual outcome of that is, it's kind of shocking. So what you want a license to mean is that you'd be focusing on whether, in fact, teachers can care for the academic, physical, social, and emotional safety of children, not to put too fine a point on it, and that they could behave ethically with young people. You would want it to mean that. It does not give you that assurance at all. Therefore, what you really want is that license assures the public and parents that the people in the classroom are entitled and have the capability to be allowed to practice independently and to take responsibility for the learning of children, which we don't have that assurance right now. So we like to think of that as a standard which says the beginning professional is somebody who is safe to practice. Okay, so that's a concept you probably don't hear people talking about very much because we don't worry enough about the question of what makes children safe, not just physically and emotionally, but academically. So for example, if you are in first grade, you have a teacher who's not skilled at teaching reading, you finish first grade not yet reading, you are deeply at risk, deeply, deeply at risk, and you may never actually catch up well. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to talk about risk with respect to young people. So I want to contrast that for a moment with a bunch of other fields. So here's hairdressing. Some of you in the room, like me, probably care about the skills of people who cut hair. Um, here's an electrician. Here is a nurse midwife. Here is a surgical team. And here is an airplane pilot. Yesterday, um, I got on a plane in Detroit in the morning and flew to Austin, Texas, where I addressed leaders of teacher education in the various 50 states. And then I flew back yesterday evening through Minneapolis to Detroit. I spent more time on a plane yesterday than anything else. And I never stopped to question when I got on a plane about whether the person flying the plane has demonstrated that he or she has the skills to take off safely, to fly through thunderstorms, to make judgments about when to wait to take off, to interpret the signals from the tower, and all of those things. I don't even know how to name all the things that person knows how to do, but I'm completely confident that when I'm on the plane, the person knows how to do it. Imagine something different. Imagine if you got on the plane and someone came on the you know, intercom and said something like this. I'm really excited that you're on the plane with me today. I've always loved aerodynamics, and I played with planes when I was a small child. Today is the first day I'm flying on my own, but I, they've told me that you know it'll take experience and I will figure it out over time and I'm really pleased to be flying for the first time with you today and I'm going to be trying really hard to do a great job. I really love flying. Nobody would stay on a plane like that. We would get off immediately. But that is actually the situation that goes on in classrooms. People say things like, I've always loved children. I know that I have to learn this through experience. I'm so excited to have you as my first group of children. And then later they say things like, my first couple of years I really wasn't very good. But I got better over time. But that we tolerate that is a big contrast between these other fields. So I'd like to highlight for you three things that my colleagues and I extracted from our study of what other fields 
professions and skilled trades routinely do that teaching does not do. One thing they've all done is they've identified the core skills, knowledge, capabilities, qualities of performance that are necessary for skilled independent practice. I know you might not think of an electrician as practicing, but I'm just trying to find a generic word for this. So you aren't entitled to be a licensed electrician if you can't do particular things that the electrical trade specifies for initial practice. Um, the second thing that they've all done is they've developed a way for novices, that is people who want to enter that trade or profession, a systematic way of gradually having them take on more and more of the actual work. Nobody comes into flight school and immediately takes a plane up in the air to, as a way of figuring out what to do, but in teacher education around the country, it's often thought to be a good thing that teacher candidates are out in schools from day one. <clears throat> Pretty odd, actually, because those are children on whom they're trying things out, and one wouldn't do that in other sectors. So instead, in these other fields, you watch an expert practitioner do the work. You might study videos. You're likely to engage in simulations or simulators. You're likely to work with computer-based kinds of simulations. You're likely to be working in teams where you only do a piece of the easier part of the work. Gradually, you have opportunities to take on independent practice under very careful supervision and very close detailed feedback. And eventually you have trial periods where you're trying out the work more or less independently but still without full responsibility. And when you can do all of that, then you have an opportunity to be examined and assessed on your ability to perform. <coughs> that's, that's what I would call detailed sequential developmental training in clinical or practice work. That's also very different. And finally, something I've already mentioned, all of these field, fields assess the individual practitioner independ independently before the person is licensed to practice. So the three things, identifying the knowledge and skills, planning a way for people to learn to practice, not just know, but do, and third, assessments of individual capability. So we set out to build that into teacher education. So what I'm gonna call the Michigan model today has those three features. We set out to clearly specify what are the highest leverage practices, that's how we named them, the highest leverage practices of teaching that are absolutely essential for skilled performance in the classroom. I'm gonna show you in a minute what I mean by that. The second thing we set out to do was to figure out what it would look like to be much more systematic about the way that teacher candidates gradually learn to do the work of teaching over time and in a variety of settings, all the way out to supervised independent practice. And we've been building performance assessments that are very different than anybody has ever built before in the field that are actually about specific capabilities in teaching and not just can you answer a test or can you write nicely about it or talk a good game, but can you do it? Can you lead a whole class discussion with 30 children on a social studies topic that we decide it's gonna be about? Can you do that? Can you actually set up small group work? Can you build relationships effectively with individual children? And so on. So those are the three features of our model. And now I'm gonna show you a little more about each of those means to give you more of a sense and then I'm gonna conclude by telling you what we're doing to scale this up. So high leverage instructional practices, we named them this because it helped us to have a piece of language that we could use to refer to a field in which there's been very underdeveloped nomenclature. So the definition of them is roughly that they are those tasks and activities that are powerful in promoting student learning and are fundamental to being skilled as a teacher. In the nursing school, the way they do go about this is they find the things that nurses do frequently and those things that put patients at risk when they're not skillful. And they use that to comprise the list of things that entrants to nursing need to be good at. And we did something similar. What are things that teachers do all the time? You really don't need a researcher to tell you, oh, that's gonna be an important skill. For example, being able to create a learning environment in the classroom that's orderly and respectful, don't really need a study to tell you that that's crucial. When you know that teachers are going to be working with 30, sometimes 35 children at a time, that's a non-trivial capability of how you get, before you teach anything at all, how do you get the classroom into a space where anybody can learn anything? There are also things that are at high risk if you can't do them well. So an example of that would be the ability of eliciting from a student, a child, getting that child to talk about what the child did as he or she did a piece of work so that you can diagnose whether the child actually knows what he or she is doing. Children can often get correct answers when they don't actually understand what they're doing. And sometimes they get incorrect answers when they do really understand that they've made some small slip. And when you can't tell the difference between those two children, you're in deep trouble as a teacher because the fundamental point of teaching is to help kids learn. So if you're flying blind and have no way 
to get kids to tell you what they're thinking, you're in really big trouble. So the skill of eliciting from children and getting them to talk is actually much harder than it seems and is a fundamental skill for skillful teaching. So what are some examples? This font is kind of small, but I just wanted you to get a few more examples in your minds. Uh, so I've said leading a whole class discussion or eliciting and interpreting individual children's thinking. Another could be formulating and posing questions. Teachers probably go through a class lesson asking more questions than giving sentences. And posing good questions is very difficult to do well. People often ask leading questions, yes, no questions, questions that already signal the answer, and they don't control well which kind of question they mean to ask when, and when they're asking them on the fly, they ask them badly. Very hard to teach skillfully if you don't become quite good at both planning and creating questions on the spot. Another one, just moving down the list a bit, it would be being able to select and use specific methods for checking whether students have learned. So again, since the whole point of teaching is student learning, if you don't know how to write a decent short quiz, or what's sometimes called an exit ticket, a question that children write on before they leave the room, you don't know how to do that well, you will be systematically not having evidence about how well your teaching is working, and you could be easily way over here working on something when most of your students are over here and you wouldn't know it. So you plan a lesson, how do you decide on the fundamental thing you should make everyone write about before they leave the room? You'd be surprised how difficult that is to do and how easy it is to write a question that wouldn't distinguish at all whether the students learned or didn't learn. You would probably write a question that if you were basically able to understand what the question meant, you could write the answer. So writing a strategic question is hard. Much harder even is to write a chapter test or a quiz. And research shows us that most teachers write actually quite unskillful tests, which again leaves them without very good information about their children's learning. Another important one would be very different, being able to conduct a meeting with a parent or a guardian about a student, whether it's about a behavior issue, progress in learning, or failure to thrive in some area. Actually very complicated to talk effectively with parents, and I know that both as a teacher myself and as a parent, having been on the receiving end of such conversations and on the giving end of them, we often don't prepare people at all for that work, and as schools become more and more diverse, teachers are frequently having to have these conversations with people that whom they're not very familiar with, they aren't so sure how to communicate with, they make a lot of mistakes in that that interrupt children's learning by not creating strong relationships with the home. So there is central skills there about the relationships with the other adults in kids' lives. So this gives you a sense of what we meant by high leverage practices. I'm gonna show you a video now, just to make this a little more concrete, of somebody in her first few months of teaching. And my goal here is to make it more concrete to you that this is high stakes stuff. That if we don't improve the standards that we hold for what people have to know how to do before they start teaching, that we will continue to put kids at risk. It's a little subtle, so I'm going to guide you. What I want you to pay attention to are two things. Can you, just by watching, name some of the things you can see the teacher having to do, even though she's just starting, that she needs to do well or the lesson isn't going to go well? We can't wait for her for three years to figure out how to do it. And the second thing, particularly if you're somewhat content-oriented, can you tell what you have to understand about the content to be able to teach it? So the content is a third grade lesson. She's teaching the concept of average. She's teaching a textbook lesson, which is what she should be doing. Her district requires it, and actually probably a good thing for a beginning teacher to use a curriculum and not make something up when he or she doesn't have enough experience to design curriculum. And this particular lesson chooses to have an activity in which the children measured their arm span. And now what the teacher is doing is adding up all the arm span lengths to teach them how you'd calculate the average arm span. So there are some issues with the curriculum's decision about this, so you can factor that into your thinking. Should this beginning teacher know how to judge whether that's a good example? Should she be able to replace it with a better one? What would that take for her to pick a different example? I want you to try to be in her shoes. She's not a terrible teacher, and she's not a highly skilled teacher either, so I'm, my point here isn't to judge her but to make you appreciate how complicated the work is from day one, so that you appreciate why having these high leverage practices could make a big difference for the quality of teaching. So the question I asked you was, can you detect some specific 
what we call high leverage instructional practices, teaching practices that she has to use. We can't wait for her to figure them out later that are necessary for teaching this lesson. And can you say anything about the kind of mathematical knowledge you need? It's more than being able to calculate an average yourself, which she can clearly do. So can you take a moment at your table, I'm just going to give you a minute or two, to see if you and somebody sitting near you can actually name something that a beginning teacher has to be able to pull off to teach even in her first month. Take a moment and see what you can name from having watched this. <laughs> Okay, let's come back together now. Would somebody be willing to name something that you and whoever you were talking to named something that you, you would call a high leverage instructional practice that teaching requires? Yes. She asked how the children came up with their So she had to be able to pose a question that would focus them on not just the answer but the process of how you get it. Good. Something else? Yes? I don't think that she actually posed the right question, though, because when she asked how you split something into equal parts, she didn't identify the words that we talked There's lots of ways to split something into equal parts, so she didn't have that. She wasn't using the skill to ask the appropriate question for the students. What's nice about your comment is that's where you see the intersection of the math knowledge and the questioning, so that would be a common sense way to ask it, but thinking carefully, you're right. How to ask that question depends on how you understand what's going on with the math, and posing the question depends on that a bit. What about something other than questioning? Did you notice some other skill you would want to name? Yes? In the beginning, she redirected the kid who has head down or something like that. And yeah. she, she was observing her classroom and trying to make sure that kids aren't yeah, she's got, you know, 30 students in that classroom. Some of them are attending, some of them aren't, some of them are hands up, want to talk, she's calling on other people. Just this batch processing nature of teaching, hard to picture if you haven't ever done that, but, you know, 30, 30 eight-year-olds is a lively kind of situation to manage. And so we can talk all we like about student learning, but you can't do it without having that capacity to keep track of where everybody is and loop them back in continuously. Unless you think that's just a matter of getting there and saying everyone's going to pay attention, you should know that that isn't how it gets done. Um, so we, let's just go on a bit. So in terms of big categories of things, and we could break these down, she needs to know how to lead a whole class discussion. That's what she's trying to do. So things like, I heard you talking here about people holding their hands up for too long and that all of that is inside that whom do you call and how long is the wait time and what do you do when someone says the wrong answer and all kinds of things about that. She's got to be able to explain and represent average herself. So she's made a lot of decisions like why those measurements are up on the board on post-its and how she st even how she's holding out her arm to explain <coughs> arm span. She's got to be able to formulate um, and pose questions. She's got to be able to take stock of this textbook lesson. Probably she should have swapped out this, med this example of the arm span. It's too many numbers. It's probably not visually very clear, like what it means to be making equal parts out of uh, arm spans. Like, are we cutting people's arms? <laughs> I mean, that's not her fault. That's what the textbook says. But what I'm signaling to you is that happens routinely. You're teaching, and the textbook has a somewhat weird treatment of something. You need to know, like, that doesn't look too good and I'm gonna have to switch it. And how do you switch it and not do something worse? Um, if I asked you right now to decide what you would use in replacement, some of you would have ideas, but your ideas would be better and less good about, some of them would be good, some of them not so good about what to do instead of arm span. So you want a beginning teacher to be able to tell when the textbook treatment is not all that great and be able to make adjustments. There's also a bunch of stuff about the math. She needs to figure out how you represent the compensative average. It's not just that you add everything up and divide, but like what is an average actually? That's what the book is trying to make clear. But what is a way to make that clear? Often people think of balancing as a way to convey average, which is different than a length you cut into equal parts. Like what are the merits of balancing as an average versus length? I mean, all of that is like inside of the math. She's got to decide, like, is the main point of this lesson learning to add up and divide, or is the main point that concept of average? If she gets that wrong, she will have a very confusing lesson. Uh, and at the end, she decides to stress how you read decimals. It's not clear whether that was the moment to do it or may, it may have been. Those are all judgment calls about the content. So 
what we've done in the first part of our redesign is to get a lot more specific about the core practices of teaching we think are fundamental and that put kids at risk if teachers aren't skillful at them. And we've tried to break each of those down to identify what is it to be skillful at leading a whole class discussion. What is involved in eliciting and interpreting student thinking? The second thing we've done is we've redesigned what we call clinical training. All teacher education engages in clinical training. That is, they place teacher candidates out in real schools with practicing teachers. Fine. We've tried to do something much more specific around the way we've redesigned this, taking as a cue what we see in other fields. So for example, one innovation at the University of Michigan is something we call instructional rounds, modeled on clinical rounds from the hospital. And the faculty, Elizabeth Moji and Bob Bain, who have developed this in our secondary program, have been in hospitals watching how medical, how medical staff use rounds and how medical students and interns and residents learn through rounds how to engage in particular diagnoses and procedures. And they have developed something analogous and appropriate for teaching that has many of those same features but fits the work of teaching. So for example, one thing they're able to do is to vary the context in which our interns are out in schools, some of them in Detroit, some of them in suburban areas, some in rural. We vary the context as well as what they're seeing on rounds, whom they work with, who the teachers are, how those teachers behave like attending physicians, how do they learn to do that. All of that is part of rounds. We're much more systematic about the use of video, of practice, and studying video in order to extract what are the principles of what the teacher is doing before they start trying to do things themselves and making it up. We engage in rehearsals, which might sound odd to you and not spontaneous enough, but in fact, if you're a beginning teacher and you practice ahead of time how you're going to lead a discussion of a book with first graders, and you get some feedback from your peers about how you're questioning and where you're looking and even how you hold the book, your chances of doing that better when you get out to a first grade classroom are hugely increased. And you get feedback before you've tried it on actual children for whom that would be a waste if you do it really badly. We have much better rubrics for rubrics or basically scoring tools for giving people focused feedback. Instead of saying something like, well, I like the way you led that discussion, not very helpful. We say, the way that you called on students followed this pattern, and did you notice that you called on all boys, and that the questions you asked of some of the boys were of much lower level? Was there a reason that you were that way in the way you asked questions? Let's go back over that. So that they learn to be much more careful about the way they're distributing the kind of engagement and who's getting to talk. And they get much more systematic clinical experience over time with much more feedback. Some of it in simulations. We've done a lot of work with simulations, but a lot of time in actual settings. But we're much more deliberate about it. I want to show you just an example of what I mean by being more careful. This is a picture from a medical uh, setting, as you can tell. And I, just to narrate what you would hear if I played a video of this, this is the attending physician right here. And this is a medical student. If you could listen in, you would hear that he's explaining the theory of defibrillation and why it is that it's so important in potentially saving lives. But he's also got his hands really on her to show her how hard you push. If you get that wrong, the whole thing is, does not work. And you can see that there are other medical students who are watching and being privy to this practicing episode. And if you're a very astute observer, you've noticed this isn't a patient, but a mannequin. So all of these features are very interesting about how carefully this particular skill, which is both theoretical and practical, is being taught. So we thought to ourselves, what would that look like in teaching? So here's an example that looks actually quite similar. Here is an intern teacher. She's rehearsing or practicing how she's going to lead a discussion of a story with a group of second graders in the next hour. Here's her attending physician, actually a teacher educator. And here are some of her colleagues. There are more of them around. And she is going through how she's going to introduce the book, what she's going to ask, which words she's going to isolate and talk about with the children. And she's getting feedback. For example, she holds up a word at one point and people tell her, like, you didn't even make the letters clear. Like, the first graders are going to have trouble reading that word. You need to print that more clearly. At another point, she fails to see that the word W-I-N-D appears in the book three different ways. Wind, wind, and then actually the word wind, W-H-I-N-E-D, also appears in the book. <laughs> and they discuss how confusing that could be to an early reader. She probably would have had this just come upon her by surprise had she not had the chance to anticipate what's going to come up. And through this, she's learning how she would do this on her own in the future. So we've developed a much more systematic and careful way of engaging in the practice part of our program. The final thing we've done is we've built new assessments of teaching performance. 
These are based on actual performance of these high leverage practices, not can you write up how you did it or you went out to a school and you tell us later how it went. They're actually having to do things in front of us, like stand up and give clear directions, be able to uh, diagnose what a child did on a piece of work and come up with the correct diagnosis, being able to lead a whole class discussion. These are the things the assessments measure, and they can fail them. And when they fail them, they get feedback and have to get more work and then retake them. They're conducted in a variety of settings. So for example, one of our high leverage practices is being able to identify common patterns of student thinking in your subject area. So for example, if you're teaching elementary math, there are errors that kids make routinely that you shouldn't be surprised by if you're an elementary teacher. You shouldn't say, oh, what's that weird answer the student came up with? I'll have to go try to think about that some more. Whereas there are things that happen all the time. You should just know they're predictable. When we assess that, we don't need to go out to a school to test that. We can show them kids talking, written work, examples, and we expect them to fluently identify what they see in these examples. We don't need to be in a school to assess that. In fact, if we went to a school, the things we want to assess might not even come up that day, so we wouldn't be able to assess it. So it depends on the thing, how we assess it, but it's always about the actual performance. So I'm just going to give you one example so you can see if you would pass. This is one in which we're assessing your diagnostic capability. That is, can you look at an error by a student and figure out quickly, not slowly, but quickly, what mathematical steps might have produced the error the child made? So you'll know that the problem is wrong. That won't be your problem. So some people think, oh, the problem with good teaching is people don't know the math. They mostly know the math, but this is what gives them trouble. So the problem you're going to see is 49 times 25. The answer to that is 1,225. That's not the question I'm asking you. But I'm going to show you three answers that are not 1225. And I'd like you to see how quickly you can diagnose how a child produced each of the wrong answers. So take a moment. You really won't have long, because I want you to be fluent at this. <laughs> These are actually quite common errors. <coughs> Does anyone in the room see, can explain any of them? Anyone want to try explaining one of them? Yes, what do you want to explain? B is easy that they didn't um, move over for the, the second line. I don't know how to say it, but I mean, I could. Well, where did the 225 come from on the first run? 225, I thought they got it from the uh, 5 times 49. Well, 5 times 49, is that 225? So you got a part of it, because I think what you're noticing is that that second line, what you're saying, isn't moved over. I think that's a piece of it. But where did that 225 come from? Any thoughts? That's one possibility. So basically, all they did was multiply uh, 25 times 9. So they did it upside down. Which is correct. You could do. You can multiplication is commutative. You can multiply in another order. But the error you're noticing came here when the person did 25 times 4 and wrote 100, when in fact it's 40 and should have been 1,000. Yeah. So it would have worked if the child who did this had noticed that this is 40 and had written 1,000 here. That would have worked. Okay. The other two are, are also difficult to ascertain. And my point right now for you is to say this is an example of of assessing someone's diagnostic capability around predictable errors. So the fact that you can't do it quickly, which I guess you can't because you're not raising your hands, is a good <laughs> sign because you, most of you aren't people who should be yet ready to pass an assessment like this. If anyone on the street could pass it, it would suggest that we're not actually getting to the core of what makes teaching particularly skilled. So just to satisfy your curiosity on this one, for example, is, here, you want to explain it? Yeah, 45, you write the 5 and then carry the 40, Five. So you're saying 9 times, times 5 is 45? 9 times 5 is 45, write the 5 and then write the 40. So what, what he's saying is the student might have written 49 times 5, uh, sorry, 9 times 5 is 45, put down the 5 and then just write the 40. And that is possible, but it's far more likely that what happened is that it was 9 times 5 is 45, carry the 4 like you would expect, but then add the 4 and the 4 together to produce 8, 8 times 5 is 40. When in fact you know that you're supposed to add the 4 after you multiply. So you would say 4 times 5 is 20 plus 4. And the same thing happens here. 9 times 2 is uh, 18. Carry the 1. 1 plus 4 is 5 times 2 is 10. So it's a, when the carry was added. 
And frankly, if you taught second or third grade, you would have to explain why is it that you don't add the carry in whenever you feel like it, because when you add multi-digit numbers, you can add the carry whenever you want. So anyway, this is a bit of an illustration, even in math content knowledge, of how you could produce assessments that are much closer to the capabilities you want people to have when they actually get licensed to teach. So trying to wrap up, I have already told you that the scale of the need is enormous. I told you that teaching is the largest workforce, that there are tons of providers. I told you many reasons why just building a better program at Michigan isn't going to get us where we want to be at all. There are 14,000 school districts, there are 3,000 providers, there are 50 million school children. I mean, you could go on and on with the scale. And so what we determined was that although we were pleased with the fact that we've been able to really bear down on this problem at Michigan, to be honest, uh, the University of Michigan graduates about 300 teachers a year. And in the space of a workforce of three and a half million, we didn't believe that we would be making a big impact on the larger national problem, or even much less the state problem. And so we moved to do something that we thought would help us to make a bigger impact. And that is, we used the creation of a new organization called Teaching Works to help ourselves scale up. So the purpose of Teaching Works is to create a way of not only being able to push out things that we've tested and learned, through the work at Michigan, but also to be a convener of work that goes on elsewhere in the country that's focused on the same agenda, to find other people who are also trying to say, it is no longer acceptable for people to enter the workforce unprepared to teach our nation's children, and how are we gonna change that? So part of it is certainly to spread the work at Michigan, but it's also to be a national leader about what it would take to completely change the system. So what is Teaching Works? It's an organization housed at the University of Michigan School of Education. You can look us up on the web by looking up teachingworks.org. Our goal is to ensure that every child in this country gets skillful teaching every year by building what we're calling a strong professional infrastructure for training, licensure, development, and assessment of teaching practice. We began this through the work we did in our own program, but have now expanded out to not only harvest and distribute things we've learned, but to gather work from elsewhere. There are four things that we're doing. One is to advance the notion of a common professional curriculum, AKA the high leverage practices, and the content knowledge needed for teaching, since teaching is about content. We're working to build licensure level performance assessments that states would adopt to build into their licensure system. We're providing training for the people who train teachers because none of this can happen without changing the way that people who are responsible for teacher training and assessment do their work. And finally, we conduct research and make what we call trustworthy information available about the nature of teaching. And we try to advance the case publicly about why teacher training is fundamental to our goal to improve student learning in this country. So that's what Teaching Works is. Um, what can you do to help us? A variety of things. You could learn more about what we're up to and about our mission. You could attend a seminar. We have seminars in person and online throughout the year. We'll begin a new round of those in September. You can learn about them on our website. You could come to visit a particular program we offer in the summer, the Elementary Math Lab, which would give you an opportunity to see teaching in public and be part of a very interesting discussion about what it takes to teach skillfully and what some of its features are by people from all around the country who could come for a day. If you look it up online, you could sign up to come. You can help to spread the word about what we're up to and you can help to support our efforts. And we hope that as we build the case for this work that we could, a decade from now, no longer be tolerating the current system, which is, you want to teach? Here's a classroom. So, thank you. This is our tagline. <laughs> we even have grocery bags with these on them so that we, if you want to help us out by carrying our grocery bag, grocery bag around that says that, then you're adding, doing a little public campaign even while you shop. <laughs> Do you have questions? We have just a couple more minutes for questions. Yes, in the back. Um, the, there's this new uh, student assessment program that's being developed coming out of the Common Core or something. I was of the assumption that that student testing would then be used to test whether the teachers are in uh, Can you discuss the overlap between teacher performance assessment and student yep. performance? That's a great question. So we know that the, there's been a large investment in building new assessments that would be assessing the goals in the Common Core. 
and we know that supposedly Michigan will be having those tests coming to us in a couple of years. So those test student learning, and as you evaluate practicing teachers in the field, which is the council that I chair, one central component of teacher evaluation is growth by students. Because what you want to know is, is a teacher doing a good job depends on the skill of her or his work in the classroom and whether his or her students grow. So those tests will inform that component of teacher evaluation. But in order to initially license a, a teacher, that person doesn't have multiple years of students whom you can look at their growth. So at the initial licensure phase, you need assessments of their ability to do what I would call high probability practices that are likely to produce student learning. And if you don't make a bet like that, you're letting people in who two years hence you may find aren't producing any learning at all. So you tie the teacher performance assessment to research that shows that these teaching practices are very likely to produce those gains. That's how it, those are the relationship for beginning teachers. For practicing teachers, it's directly part of the assessment system. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a great question, thank you. Yes? Has there been any research that, that you're familiar with that talks to how extraneous factors might negatively impact the ability to bring in all these high leverage professionals? I, at what point is class size too big that doesn't matter how good of a teacher you are or, or physical space that just, it's too cold? <laughs> yeah. you, you know, I just no, of course, and I think there, of course there are other factors that influence good teaching. The thing that's so striking about the teacher effects research is that they factor in these other things to help explain like why did a class not go well and what, what's so persuasive is that the teacher effects remain the largest factor. That doesn't mean these other things don't matter. And in fact, the class size research is pretty inconclusive, as is the teacher pay research, by the way. Um, class size turns out not to be highly related to student growth, despite our beliefs. I mean, there's some threshold beyond which that's true, but it's far more about the skill. Like, if, try to think about it. You have a teacher who's not very skillful teaching a very small class. He or she isn't going to teach any better just by having fewer students. You're right that some like extremes, but in general, the range that's typical, there's not, there have not been good effects, strong effects. So it doesn't mean none of those things should be paid attention to. I don't want to be sound so extreme, but the point I'm making is that investment in better skilled teaching would get us a big payoff, uh, payoff as in learning. <laughs> yes? Poverty and lack of parental support. Yeah, so that's one of the things that's factored into these analyses is measures of income, family income, family, family education, uh, family involvement, and while those are in the models, they don't predict student achievement gains as much as the skill of the teacher does. So that's, what's so that's what has gotten us to be so persuaded that this is something to work on. Again, it doesn't mean no one should be tackling poverty. That would be kind of silly for me to say that, but if you're really intent on making big gains for kids, changing the way teachers are licensed and the support they have to do their work has, can have a very, very significant effect. Yes? So this seems sort of like the opposite approach of Teach for America. I just wonder what you think of Teach for America. Um, I will say this about Teach for America. Teach for America has tried to really change the way people think about teaching. They've tried to make it much more attractive to people <laughs> who for quite a while have thought of it as completely un, un, uh, wouldn't think of entering teaching. So I think that's very important. I think that has done us a lot of good. At the University of Michigan, there are lots of undergraduates who have now become concerned about educational improvement, which is great. It is true that Teach for America has not been as strong at insisting that people can do certain things before they enter, but I will also say that over the 20 years they've existed, they've constantly improved their initial training. So it is true that our argument is somewhat different, but I also have a lot of respect for how hard they've worked to improve what they're doing. And we are, in fact, the certification partner for TFA Detroit, and we are gradually improving and improving and improving the support that the Detroit-based teachers are getting. And it's partly we do this because we're, you know, we are a research university and we're trying to learn, could TFA get to a threshold where its effects for the people would be better than they have been? What would you suggest for, for creating a better trained pool of substitute teachers? Because I hear from my students all the time, That's a great oh, question. you only need 90 credits and, uh, and you can teach as a substitute teacher anywhere, and you're sent everywhere. And that's a fascinating question. I get a lot of the same questions when I talk, and that question has never come up. It's a great question because, of course, teacher absenteeism, especially when teachers feel very unskillful, rises. So the less skilled the teacher feels, the more likely it is the teacher is to be out, and that's compounded then by having people replacing the teacher temporarily who aren't that skillful. And that's a whole problem that deserves considerably more policy attention, and it hasn't been something we've been 
focused on, but I think you're entirely right to bring that up. It should be something we should attend to more than we are. Very, very, very good point. Yeah. What happens to, especially in the higher grades, the violence that the teachers, because the teachers, my friends have been teachers forever. They're just going there defending themselves and hoping they get through the day. It isn't like we teach them anything. We have to defend ourselves because it's either the student or the parents. Yeah. No, I mean, it's obviously the case that there are schools where teachers and kids are, unsafe, are in unsafe conditions, where there's poor leadership or no leadership, where there's not good community support. That's all true. So the only thing I want you to take away from this is that is important to solve, and if you solve that, you still won't get better learning for kids. So it's, these things have to all be tackled, and what, the reason we're making such a strong argument about the improvement of training and licensure is that that problem often gets left out completely. So it's important to be working on school safety, and there are people working on that. It's important to work on improving leadership in schools and the like. But if you don't improve the skill of the teaching, you will have quieter and safer classrooms, and still nobody will be learning very much. That's all I'm really saying is it's, it's an important factor in the mix. It's not that what you just said isn't crucial. And in fact, when schools where kids are engaged in learning, it's also the case that violence declines. So these aren't unrelated things. Teachers, kids act out when they're in settings where, I mean, it's not the cause of it, but it's not unrelated. Yes? Uh, this common core standards, uh, they show in the, uh, the, the legislation become quite political. And how, how do, you, do you come to some of, I mean, do they approach you? Or what is your role? So this question is about the common core. As you know, this has become a very politicized issue in our state. Um, I think your question is, did they approach me about this? <laughs> um, no, they did not approach me. It's actually quite related to the educator. It's quite an important issue for the educator evaluation system because we can't have a teacher evaluation system if we don't have common standards for student learning. So if we don't, if we don't end up installing and implementing the Common Core, we won't be able to have a high quality teacher evaluation system in the state because there won't be a way to evaluate growth when there are no common standards. But it relates to this agenda as well because earlier I mentioned that we don't, we're not very good at comparing ourselves to other countries. We say things like, oh, teachers are paid more, they're respected more. But one of the biggest differences between the United States and all these other countries is that they have a national curriculum, not a federal curriculum, but a common curriculum about what children learn. When you have a common curriculum, you can train teachers better because you can actually train them to teach the curriculum. Right now in this country, when you train teachers, you don't know what curriculum you're going to teach. That would be like training physicians and not knowing what instruments they're going to use or what medications they're going to administer. It would be very strange. So the main thing that teachers do is teach curriculum. And because there's no common curriculum, teacher education is sort of about teaching nothing to nobody in particular, which isn't a very effective way to do it. But there are many, many, there are many, many political arguments about the Common Core. I, I have a hard time with it because when I think about it, it's really, do we really think that kids in Idaho shouldn't learn fractions or kids in the UP don't need to learn about linear functions in high school, but kids in Detroit, I mean, it's, we're talking about math and learning to read and write, but I think it's clouded by the idea that, you know, parents and communities should have the right over their own children's learning. And, when people argue that, I understand it, but it makes it very difficult to improve the quality of teaching and learning when we can't reach some agreement about what we want young people to learn. I just wanted to do this, uh, before, you know, like you were here uh, before the legislature, have you given any talks? Or I would be happy to do that if they invite me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I've had individual conversations with some people, but no, they haven't. And there may be opportunities because I think this will go on being a hot topic in our state for a while. Yes? Um, just a quick question about the rankings. I, I talk to a lot of teachers and people in education who say that to put the United States in 11th and 24th in the world, we put all of our kids together, including special needs kids, whereas in other countries they track them so that the numbers are comparable. What is well, actually, the numbers I put up were about grade four. So that's before the sorting system okay. happens in other right. countries. I mean, you can go too far with these rankings, but let's say it's either even roughly, roughly right to be below the mean of the OECD countries. Let's say that's slightly wrong. It's like we're slightly above the mean. You would actually expect the United States to be at the top of the achievement curve in the world, and we're nowhere close to that. And there are other countries that are hugely diverse and where poverty is an issue. The country everyone likes to compare us to right now is Finland, which 
isn't very comparable. It's very small. It's 98% Lutheran and white. That is really very different, but there are other countries that have been successful with quite diverse populations that don't all sort, and it's worth our thinking a bit. It's also the case that the differentials within our country are as great as the international. So if you're uh, a student of the brown or black skin and you live in a low-income environment, the differences between what you get and what you learn are as dramatic between that and upper-middle-class white children or Asian children. So their internal differences are huge, too. I know that many of you have other things to go to, but I really want to thank you for coming out today and I'd be delighted to hear from you about your questions or ideas about our agenda in any ways that you can help to advance it. We'll very much appreciate it, but thank you very much for coming. Again, thank you, Dean Ball. This was such an excellent presentation and we certainly would like to make this available to every teacher, every educator in the state of Michigan and beyond. And this presentation that you've seen today will be on the University of Michigan website in about two weeks. So you'll be able to review it again and you'll be able to share it with others. On behalf of the Wolverine Caucus, Dean Ball, I wanted to extend to you this gift as a token of our appreciation for you coming not once but three times oh, to you so much. address the Wolverine Caucus over the years. And um, we all feel that we are smarter as a result. And I, I think I got one of the problems right that she put up. It's <laughs> awesome, a Wolverine Caucus pen. That's great. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you again, everyone, for coming, and I hope that you will join us again in September when we have our next Wolverine Caucus Forum. It will be entitled The Michigan Surgical Quality Collaborative, A New Approach to Improving Healthcare Quality and Reducing Cost, something we all would like to see happen, right? So that will be on September 18th. Again, that is Wednesday, September 18th, 2013. And we hope that you will join us at 1130 at the Christman Building. Have a wonderful summer, and we will see you in September. Go Blue! <laughs>